You're, 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 you're listening to the podcast for all of the news, notes, and breakdowns for your Ohio State Buckeyes. This is Sons of the Shoe with Nick Wilson and Spencer German. It is Sons of the Shoe, Spencer German, with you, and Something that I was actually a little bit worried about, or actually I, I, I thought it was a good thing um, a week ago before the Oregon game because I was like, oh, hey, you're not going to have the what, what Alabama just did, which was you win a big game and then on the other side maybe you let up a little bit because it's an inferior opponent, it's not Oregon, it's not the same stage. And instead I actually think it's a bad thing because after that loss on, on Saturday – I would have rather they play immediately this week and allow us to kind of wipe our wipe that loss. I mean, we're never going to forget, but wipe as much as we can that loss from our memory. Guys, we are still a relatively new podcast. I want to remind you to like, subscribe, review. That's one of the big ones. Review the podcast, because if you review the podcast, it shows up more in people's timelines as recommended podcasts. People that are Ohio State fans that maybe don't follow the show just yet. We need your support. We need your help. And we appreciate it as always, those of you who join us via the 92 to the Fan YouTube channel or any of the other avenues where you can find the show, the Odyssey app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Again, I reiterate, Apple Podcasts. We appreciate you guys jumping on in, however you participate in the show. Um, so how are we feeling? Because I have calmed down since Saturday night. If you couldn't tell in the live show that we did or if you caught it after the fact, I was pretty fired up. And I'm still fired up about certain things and certain points from that game. I want to revisit a few things because there are some parts of this that I think are, are important for me to rehash and, and take away as positives from this game. But I also do think there's still some things that stand out as like problems for this team, problems for the Buckeyes, and and reasons why I'm still frustrated. And um, I, I guess, I mean, I don't know. Do we want to start positive? Do we want to start negative? I think that's the kind of the question here. Because I am still pretty upset just about Ryan Day in general. And it's why, like, the, the title of this episode, Ryan Day has the hottest seat in college football. I think that's 100% true. But I'll, I'll get to that coming up because I want to – because I said I'm calmed down, I'm going to start with the positives. I, I have had a chance to do some self-reflection, look back on this game a little bit. And the first thing I'm going to say is that, guys, I am still – I think we're all getting used to this this 12-team playoff era where one loss doesn't just completely sink your, your season entirely. Um, and because of that, I I think like I I I was I was emotional on Saturday, rightfully so. I mean, it was right after the game, right? I felt like and, and maybe in many ways it was like a player having played in that game just moments ago, and you show up and there's a microphone in your face and the camera. And you got to react in real time. And so the emotions are flowing. I I was upset. As an Ohio State fan, I was upset. Um, I thought they were going to win that game. I I thought that they got exploited. And I was frustrated. But I I am still getting used to the idea that one loss doesn't sink your season. And when the eight people came out, we, I think, saw that that was abundantly clear. Just this idea that, like, okay, they lost that game. But but they only dropped, you know, uh, one spot or two spots to, to number four. They're still one of the highest rate teams in the country, and there's still a chance for them to kind of dig themselves out and, and get back in that conversation. I mean, two weeks from now, a little over two weeks from now, when they play Penn State, it's an opportunity where if they go win that game, okay, now they're back in the top three most likely. I, I know the college football playoff, I think, rankings come out, I think, actually at the week after that Penn State game. So it'll be a chance for Ohio State to certainly reestablish themselves. But on the other hand, like, that game is a little bit nerve wracking because if you lose that game, now you're talking about two losses and your strength of schedule in terms of out of conference is complete shit. So this team has a lot sort of still on their plate. They still have a lot to figure out. Um, and they're, and they, they they certainly can still get back in the playoff picture or, or it's, or they're certainly still in the playoff picture with a chance to, to still make some noise and achieve everything they wanted to achieve. And I think I needed to kind of re- just reflect on that a little bit over the last couple of days since the game. And remember like, it's a different era. One loss doesn't sink your season. And in some ways, I'll, I'll say this, maybe the one thing that made me feel better this week about that loss was just the idea that 
I didn't that I got the one thing I was worried about going into this year as we talked about Oregon and as we talked about the idea that maybe they play multiple times like week six and then in a big 10 or week seven and then in, in a big 10 championship and then maybe even playing a third time in the college football playoff I kept kind of coming back to this idea that like it is hard to beat a team multiple times and so if they lost the game one maybe this sets the stage for you make a run, get to the Big Ten Championship, and then you play him again, and you're able to kind of exact some revenge and learn something from that game. I, I think there's something to be said for that. So that makes me feel a little bit better because I was nervous about that coming into the season that now you 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 know you you played them so close and it really came down to like one or two plays here or there. Okay, maybe things go differently the next time around. And so that that was one positive I took away. I also do think too, like because the, the the system now affords you an opportunity to you know experience some adversity and learn from it, and and I think that's valuable for this team as well, especially given that I think they got exposed in certain ways where and it's it's reminiscent of the last time they won a national championship, you know, 2014 season. You lose to Virginia Tech, they still climb their way back into the picture and then make the playoff and then go on to win the title, like. Now you have more wiggle room to like, okay, we lost the game early. We had to face some adversity. We had to learn something. We had to look in the mirror. And now we can go and, you know, still chase that championship. It 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 doesn't sink your season. It it allows you an opportunity to learn in season without it being like, okay, your season's over. That's it. You're done. Um, and so I think there's value in that. And so I think in real time, as Ohio State fans, we are experiencing and seeing the value of the 12-team playoff just from a standpoint of, you know, it, 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 yes, we want the Buckeyes to be perfect. We want them to win every game. We want to blow everybody out. That's not going to always happen. But now they, they, because they maybe lose one or two games here or there to, to a Michigan, which we hope never happens again. But of course, it always, it, it, that's a great robbery. So it will, um, or to a Penn State or to an Oregon, like we saw that, you know, there's still a chance for you to do what you want to do and, and still prove that you're one of the best teams in this country and then have a shot at the title at the end. So, um, I, I, I've since reflected and realized that I like that about this new system. The other thing that I want to highlight, I, uh, I was harsh on Will Howard because of the, the end of the game situation. And I don't want to, I, I actually, I, and I will say this, I don't know that I was totally unfair because I do think that on, on some level, um, like people will, people will look back. And the one thing they're going to remember, the one thing that they're going to remember from that game in regards to Will Howard um, is that that end of the end of the game sequence where they have the six seconds, he slides down in field goal range thinking, OK, we just, you know, put ourselves in a position to to potentially win this thing and with a field goal, not realizing that time had expired. Um and I, I understand where that's frustrating. Obviously, the Dan Lanning, which we'll get to, the Dan Lanning manipulating the, the rule book a little bit by putting 12 men on the field. I'm thinking, I, I'm guessing Will sort of imagined he had he had more time because they reset the clock and they obviously didn't. Um, but yeah, like that, that was a, a, a key moment in that game. And we are going to look back and remember that being sort of like the, oh no, for Will Howard. But in the same breath, like, guys, I, I went away, as I've since reflected, feeling like Will Howard checked the boxes. I was one of the harshest critics of Will Howard through the first four games of the season. I kept saying, like, I just need to see more. I just – I need to see it on a certain stage. I need to know that he can deliver in these big moments. And, guys, like, he did that, I thought, in spades up until the final few seconds. 28-35, 326 yards and two touchdowns against one of the best teams in the country. Like, that is the thing I was waiting to see. And, and we flat out saw it in this game um, on a national stage, bright light shining down on you, whole nine yards. He was brilliant. He was great. He was a really, really good quarterback. And so I do think he answered the bell in regards to the questions of can he do it for this team on that stage? Is he the quarterback for this team that, that can essentially take – like? that you feel confident on, on the biggest stages, he's going to take you to the, the, he can, he can lead you to a national championship. Like that was the thing we were waiting to see from Will. And I think he showed us that without question in this game against Oregon. So I am, 
I'm not going to say I'm done being critical of Will Howard because there might be games where he makes mistakes and we have to look back and be like, well, this wasn't good enough for the Ohio State standard. But in that game, he lived up to the Ohio State standard. He's checked all the boxes for me now. And I do have confidence that he can be the quarterback that leads this team to a national championship. Now, I have questions about other areas, which I'm going to get to here in a second. But I do think that he proved he is the quarterback this year that can take this team to where it needs to go with all the talent that's around him. He was great. Aside from the last couple of seconds, which I know is the thing people are going to remember most, he was great. And and so I need to give him his flowers now and and point out the fact that I maybe didn't highlight that enough after the game. I, I feel confident Will Howard now, and I'm not necessarily uneasy about him going into future games and, and, and especially big games when they're going to need him most. Now, the other the, the big part of this and the reason why I'm still upset about this loss as, as a whole is that I do think Oregon exposed you in certain areas. And and I think most notably they exposed you maybe not so much. I mean, the offensive line is going to have issues because Josh, Josh uh, Simmons is, is, is done for the year. Um, at least as, as far as Ryan day has alluded to, he's, he's done for the year. And that is your starting left tackle. The guy that you were, were obviously counting on to, to lead this group or not, not only him because you, you obviously thrown in there. Um, you you obviously have uh, Donovan Jackson next to him, and the left side of this offensive line is was supposed to be sort of the the strength of this group, and they, and I think they had shown that, especially in recent weeks, that they were the the, the dominant group that you were expecting, um, and that you you were seeing some good things from them. But now you turn it over to Zen uh, Mikulowski, and I, like I, now I'm worried about that group. Uh, a little bit more because you now have an injury problem. Um, but even even still, like maybe there were some weaknesses there that we saw in the Oregon game a little bit, but it wasn't such a glaring concern that that um, at least in that game specifically, I think the Don. I, I think what was exposed though was the defense, and particularly the defensive front. Because listen, we can say I was harsh on the second day and for good reason. They played terrible, and and Denzel Burke as a guy that's supposed to be a first, a potential first round pick and one of the top corners in this next NFL class, he was God awful. I mean, that group as a whole needs to play better, especially if they're going to go around touting themselves as the, the best in America. We have the best secondary group in the, in the, in America. Okay. Well then, 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 then Frank, frankly, fucking prove it. Like you gotta be better than what they were in that game. But I will say this in their defense to us to an extent. And it's not, it, it's a small percentage of the, the equation here, not a small percentage, but it is a percentage of the equation here, not the full, like you could still play better, but like part of being a defensive back is you need a, a defensive line that makes a quarterback's life a little bit difficult so that, because if you have to block, if you have to defend a guy for 15 seconds downfield, and I, I'm, I'm exaggerating there a little bit, but like, you know, beyond like six to 10 seconds, like, that's that's where you start to have problems, and that's where you do start to get exposed as a secondary. I don't care how good you are. You're not going to hang with a guy for that long when you're just running around the field. So I think the defensive line is a problem. Like, this group came back, veteran group. I was so excited about Jack Sawyer, guy who I, I thought flashed in the uh, – I always forget if it was the damn Peach Bowl. I, I think it was the, the – uh, I think it was the Cotton Bowl. He flashed last year in the in the bowl game. And I thought, like, okay, he's finally turning that corner. He's going to come back next year, have a really big year as an, as, a, as an elite pass rusher for Ohio State, go down in history with the Chase Youngs and the Bosa brothers and all these different guys. And where was he? Felt like he was pretty much non-existent in this game. And I just, like, I didn't feel like there was a lot a, a lot of good there. They, they, like, they had zero sacks, this this defense did as a group. Um, and JT Tuimolo out, like he's a great player and he does more than just rush the passer passer. And that's kind of the point here. Like I'm not expecting him to, to just like rack up every single sack. Like he can, he plays the run very well and he does some good things. And he did, he was the one guy who got any sort of quarterback hits on Dylan Gabriel. So that's, that's great. But like, I, I need these guys to show up in, in those moments. And I, I thought they were exposed as, as a line that can't really generate a lot of pressure. And therefore that left the defense, I think also in a bit of a pickle. Um, and, and then you, I, I think along those lines, like Jim Knowles had some problems because he didn't start bringing the pressures early enough. And when he did finally start bringing the pressure, it was, you know, like it was, it, it didn't matter. Then they, then Dylan Gabriel was confident. He was picking apart the secondary. So 
they got to be better. I, I think up front, the front four need to be able to generate pressure on their own more often. I understand it's not going to be every single play and every single snap, but what you need is a, you need to do a little bit better of, of being able to operate on your own as a group of four. And then on top of that, Jim Knowles complimenting those guys with blitzes, timely blitzes, using the blitz at the right time. So I'm, I'm worried about this defense moving forward. Like what we saw last Saturday was not a defense that I think is ready to win a national championship and beat a Georgia or an Alabama or, I don't know, a, te- a Texas, because Texas is number one in the country right now. To beat those teams, the defense is going to have to be better on top of the fact that, like, yeah, like there's – there's like they have to – they can't shoot themselves in the foot on both sides of the ball, and they have to be more aware of certain situations like they were at the, like at the end of the game. But, like, that, that defense feels like a real problem now. And I am like, I've, I've turned the magnifying glass, the microscope that I had on Will Howard. I have turned that to the defense. Holy, like they have a lot to prove to me between now and Penn state. They have a lot to to prove to me between now and Michigan. And frankly, they have a lot to prove to me between now and a big 10 championship slash whatever awaits them on the other side. If it's, if it's a run in the college football playoff or not. So um, that is my biggest concern for this team moving forward. What is your biggest concern for the Buckeyes moving forward after the loss to Oregon? What are the silver linings that you're taking away from this game? And are you feeling better about Will Howard? Or are you totally confident that Will Howard's the right guy for this team at quarterback moving forward? Let us know at the 92 to the fan YouTube channel in the comment section. You can also hit me up on Twitter at Spencito underscore. Let's take a break. When we get back, we can't avoid the elephant in the room any longer. I, I have raised the, the hot seat ometer or the hot seat ometer. Sorry, I always do ometer like it's like it's an Irish. Uh, Irish bar or something like that Um, on Ryan Day how long of a leash does he get with his seat being as hot as it is and the fact that he is now one and seven against top five teams during his coaching tenure with the Buckeyes we'll talk about it next but keep it locked real quick here's a word from our sponsor All right, guys, welcome back into Sons of the Shoe. And uh, yeah, it's time to have that conversation. Ryan Day, as I said on Saturday night, one and seven against top five teams during his tenure at Ohio State. And so here, so here's the thing, because I understand like you can go back and you can find context for so many different reasons why this record is what this record is. The the Georgia game in the college football playoff a couple years ago comes to mind. You lose Marvin Harrison Jr. to a concussion. Okay, like that's 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 a tough break. And and if he if he doesn't get hurt, I, I I still maintain that I think they win that game because he was dominating Georgia's secondary. Like he was he was playing some of the best football we'd seen. He was brilliant. Um, and I and so was C.J. Stroud. Like I, I think they win that game if he um if he ends up staying in the game, but. Uh, so I get that. Um, you you can point to this past weekend, the 12 man on the field penalty. You you could have set yourself up for a field goal chance to win the game. Obviously that doesn't happen because of that. And Ohio state loses in a weird way and in, in sort of dumb in, in a dumb, really in a dumb way because of that, the, the, the misuse of the 12 man on the field penalty by Dan Lanning. But we'll, we'll and we're going to get to that coming up, but um, like, so yes, there's context for certain games that they've won or lost or whatever. The three Michigan losses, though, like you got to mostly wear those. The two of them were, were pretty much runaways by Michigan. Last year was close, came down to a few plays here or there, but your quarterback threw an interception in crunch time and to start the game. And those that's the thing that kind of cost you. So, listen, I understand, like, you, you can look back and find reasons why, you know, 2020, they get to the championship game and Bama's just a juggernaut. Okay, in, in a weird COVID year, fine. Like, I, I get that there's all those things and those things exist, but. I can no longer sit here and defend Ryan Day. I, I have tried. I've tried to say, like, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. It, it, it makes me a little bit nervous about what you're going to get if you move on from Ryan Day. But the fact that he, here's, here's, the, here's the thing. I, I, I thought about this recently because, like, Dabo Sweeney, and you guys know I, I can't stand Dabo Sweeney. But the one thing I'll say is, like, during his time at Clemson, we always used, there was the phrase, there was, we used to call it Clemsoning games. Because they would always lose big games, like in weird ways, or just get blown out. Like they couldn't win big games under Dabo for the longest period of time, 
And then something changed. And he he was given time to sort of like figure it out. And he kept on going, kept on pushing. And he had the time. And then eventually his team becomes a national champion two times over. And he is leading one of the more prominent programs in the country because of it. So he was afforded the time to do that. But I but here's the thing. And here's, here's the difference for me. Or Clemson, I almost said Oregon. Clemson at that time was like, they were always a, a, a team that was in the picture in terms of being ranked and competing and, and, you know, fighting for the ACC, but they weren't where Ohio state is. Ohio state has a different expectation than Clemson did at the time when Dabo was going through those growing pains and struggles and all those different things. That's just fact. And so him getting the time, like they stuck it out with him because they were like, we believe that he can get this thing going in the right direction. He had more time to, to, to do that because of where Clemson was at in the landscape of things. They have since become more one of the programs that you think of when you think of like, oh, national title contender. Maybe not in the last couple of years, but there's people who are more casual football fans, college football fans, who at least recognize that Clemson recently has won national championships. And and that would be a talking point for them. So like, the but again, the difference is the standard was there, there was different than it is now. And it's different than what it is and pretty much always has been at Ohio State. At Ohio State, you are expected to beat Michigan as, as number one and then compete for national championships every single year. And if you don't do that, I'm sorry. Like, frankly, the jig is up for you. Like, you, you get found out pretty quickly. So I understand, like, and, and I've tried to tout it as well. He always wins the other games. He's competitive in, in most of these games against top top five teams. And But at some point, like, the the, the tax comes due. At some point, you have to deliver in those moments and in those games, or else we're go- we're all going to we're all going to point the finger at you. Most notably, I think at this point, like I, I mentioned, t- Dabble having time, Ryan Day has had time to get this thing together. He has had time to figure out how to win those games on those stages. It, you know, when when you want to clench, just don't. You know, find a way to get your team over the top, and he continues to 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 just blow it. And frankly, guys, like this year is maybe the year where it's the most inexcusable because they invested so – all we hear about Ohio State is the most expensive roster college football combined, blah, 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 NIL, blah, blah, blah. They, they, they really dove into this stuff, and it's so wrong what they're doing. and blah, Whatever. People are criticizing them left and right. Those people were laughing at Ohio State when they lose to Oregon the other night because they invested so much money in this team. This, this was the year it was supposed to all come to a head. You have this great roster – Loaded with talent. We know it's loaded. I mean, Caleb Downs comes over via the transfer portal. You got Quinshawn Judkins coming to the transfer portal. Will Howard, plus all your guys from last year pretty much come back to try to win a national championship and do something in the Big Ten. And then you lose on that stage. Like, I get it. There were circumstances that led to losing that game. Most notably, the fluky, dumb uh, 12 men on the field thing. Fine. I get it. I understand it's not always, like, not everything is, is within Ryan Day's control. But what is in your control is 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 that record. He's now one and seven against top five teams. He's going to have a chance, in, potentially, assuming that Ohio State beats Nebraska. Well, I mean, even if they don't, as long as Penn State beats Wisconsin, which is their game after a bye week this week, next week they play Wisconsin. So as, as long as Penn State beats Wisconsin, you go on the road to Penn State. That is going to be a raucous environment and a chance for you to get a, top, a win against a top three team. And if you lose that one, a team that you have largely owned and a coach that you are now getting compared to is like those two guys. Basically it's just a matter of like, who's not going to bungle things more. And Ryan day generally in that matchup hasn't bungled things more. And James Franklin has like, he can't win the big game either. You can't possibly lose that game. Like if he loses that game, I think that might be it. I mean, he's probably going to get the rest of the season to, to, to see how this thing goes, but you can't possibly lose that game to Penn state and, and not have, have a legitimate conversation about what his future holds uh, with this team, especially because like I said, in the first segment, if they lose to Penn state, their non-conference is not good enough that you, that is a shoe in that they make it to the college football playoff with two losses, especially if they don't get back to that big 10 championship game, which you would assume Penn state would then be in that picture because they would be the team that beat you. And maybe only ends up having one, depending on how many losses they were to get, they might not, you know, they, they might have the, the shot or the, they'd have the, the clear path to getting there against now Oregon, who also has a clear path as well. So guys, like I, um, 
first of all, I want to apologize to many of you for taking so long to maybe get here. Because I know there's been people for years calling him John Cooper 2.0 and all these different things. But, you know, I, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. I tried to think about the context of many of these situations and games that he had lost. I can't do it anymore. I can't keep making excuses for the guy. He's 1-7 in seven in those big games. And like I said, I understand that that Dabo was afforded the time to sort of figure it out and get his team right. And when he couldn't win big games, he finally fit, found a way and, and found the right recipe. And then he became a two-time national championship coach because of it. But with Ohio State, man, like the standard's different. And with this roster especially, the standard is different. You were supposed to come in and be dominant. And I'm not saying you're going to blow out Oregon. I, I think it was um, I think it was Urban Meyer who at one point said, like, there's four or five games a year where you look across the field and you know those guys have what you have. You got to find a way to get it done in those games. Ryan Day can't do that. We know Urban Meyer could. He did it time and time again and won you a national championship here and cemented himself as a, as a great, one of the greatest coaches in Ohio State history because of it. Now, you can make all the, you can say what you want about like some of the, the bad losses he had along the way, but you would take one or two of those losses every couple of years um, against the Purdue or against an Illinois or against, uh, 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 I don't know, a, 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 a Rutgers. Uh, that's not fair to Rutgers. Rutgers is turning their program around. They have a really good team this year, actually. So that's not fair to Rutgers. But you know what I mean. Like, you would take those losses every now and then for making a run to a national championship because you know your coach isn't going to pee down his leg on Saturday or Monday or whatever when the when a championship game is getting played against the the big boys when you have a roster that should equal or match. So, guys, like, frankly, that I'm at a point right now. I think Ryan Day has the hottest seat in college football right now after this loss to Oregon. I'm not even kidding. I know there's some other hot ones out there. Maybe you could bring up Marcus Freeman because he had the NIU loss, but he's his his team's pretty much blown people out the rest since since that game. Um, you know, uh, people you could throw out some other names, and I know we had a conversation about who has the hottest seat in college football before the season started. And I I I think I had Ryan Day near the top or at the top, whatever. I think it's 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 hotter than ever. I think that uh, he, without a doubt, now is is the the coach with the hottest seat going the rest of the way. And this loss afforded you no wiggle room now. Like, you got to beat Penn State in a couple weeks. That game is going to be a mic. Like, that. talk about being in a microscope. That game is going to be looked at and analyzed. How Ryan Day handles it, if his team wins, all these different things. That is going to be the hyper focus of this team or of, of, the, of the national media, of us, local media, um, in terms of how he performs in that stage. Because if he loses that one, he loses to another top three team, I think that's it. Like, the jig is up for Ryan Day at that point. And even if he finishes out the season, I, I, I think he's done. I, I think he has to be, especially with the new AD in there who's trying to, you know, make his own mark and, and leave his own legacy here with, the, with, with Ohio State in the athletic department. And otherwise, like, you, you can't keep trying the same thing, expecting different results. He's got to – at some point, he's just got to do it. And that's where I'm at with Ryan Day. He, he's, he's had enough time. If he doesn't deliver this year with a roster that they paid that, – that, that, and, and that we, the fans, like fans – gave money to help fund this team to put it in a place where they could go win a national championship. And if you don't even come close, you don't even sniff it. You don't even get out of the big 10 laughable can't, cannot happen. And uh, the jig is up for me on Ryan day at this point, it's time for him to put up or shut up, frankly. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the bottom line. All right, guys, we take another break when we get back. Well, and, and guys, feel free to comment uh, at the 92 to the fan YouTube channel uh, on Twitter at Spence to underscore um, is the jig up for Ryan Day? Is he officially on the hottest seat in college football? If he wasn't already, we'll uh, answer those. We'll, we'll, I, I'm curious your thoughts on the subject as well, which I know is a very, uh, very timely, but also hot, hotly debated one among Ohio State fans. Let's pause for a quick word from our sponsors. When we get back, the Michigan panic meter, which did move for me after the game on Saturday. We'll see where I'm at now. And another rendition of Four Down Territory. It's Spencer German here, Sons of the Shoe. Keep it locked. When, when we get back after this quick break. All right, guys, welcome back in, Sons of the Shoe. And uh, we start this final segment with the Michigan Panic Meter. Nick is going to get on me for moving my Michigan Panic Meter. I know he is. But, guys, like, 
I, I, I don't trust Ryan Day anymore. Like in that, in that game, even if Oregon, even if Michigan, I keep going back to Oregon. They're just living rent free in my head, I guess. Um, if Mich- even if Michigan is not a top 10 team or whatever, by the time that game rolls around, um, t- how do I have any trust that on that stage, Ryan Day is going to, going to get the job done with his team. So he's got a lot to prove to me in, uh, along with this defense, like I alluded to in the first segment, the rest of the way that Penn state game is going to be a massive one. Um, and yeah, like I'm at least a little bit nervous about Michigan now, not be, and here's the thing. I'm not nervous about Michigan because of Michigan. It's nothing Michigan did. It's all just because of what Ohio state does under Ryan day. And I, I don't know if I can trust him in that game at this point. So because of that, I'm in the light gray. This is maybe a little bit too much in the light gray. Like I probably would move it a little bit more to the left. Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little too close to white right now. And I don't like that, but that's just the, the graphic. We just kind of did generic versions of the graphic in each sort of uh, each sort of phase of the the, the panic meter. So that's kind of what we're stuck with right now. I, I I could shift it a little bit. Maybe I'll work on that for for next next week. But yeah, I'm I'm in the light gray with it because I just don't know if I can trust the Buckeyes and Ryan Day on that game in that game on that stage come Thanksgiving weekend. Because um, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to trust them against Penn State in two weeks. So we'll just have to see. Well, uh, what is your Michigan panic meter at? And we'll see what Nick's is at when he rejoins us, obviously, next week, leading up to the um, Nebraska game. But in the meantime, guys, we have another edition of uh, Four Down Territory. And we go first to first down. I said we were going to get to this. Dan Lanning was asked about whether or not he intentionally put 12 men on the field with the 10 seconds left so that the Buckeyes would run a play, they'd kill some clock, and then – Ohio State would run out of time to be able to, to do anything. And uh, I, his answer, he tried to be very, very political about it, at least it seemed. Um, also, though, kind of admitted to it. And then I think what really admits to it, though, is the smile that he gave. And if you're not watching this, uh, if you're if you're doing if you listen to the audio version of the show, you won't be able to notice the smile. But uh, you can find the the video version on the 92 to the fan YouTube channel. Just look at this smile and tell me that this isn't a guy who knows what he was doing. Much of the uh, commentary world has decided and struck you as a genius, Stan, for the 12-man penalty and declared that it was intentional. Uh, was it indeed intentional to induce the throw one-on-one against Jabbar in that spot? It wasn't one-on-one. He, we actually had a safety on top. So there was a, so it's called dog. It's when you play. But he wasn't in an extremely tight coverage, but he was in dog coverage where he had safety on top of him. And uh, yeah, there was a timeout before that. We spent an inordinate amount of time on situations. There are some situations that don't show up very often. Uh, in college football, but uh, this is one that uh, obviously uh, was something that we we have worked on. So um, you can see the result. By saying at the end that it was something that they worked on, I think that tells you uh, that, yes, he prepared for the situation. And uh, the smile also just tells, tells you everything you need to know. He clearly did it on purpose. It's a loophole in the system. It's why college football is now looking at this rule and deciding what to do with it because it is bullshit. I said it on Saturday night. It is complete and utter bullshit. I'm not going to sit here and say this is why they lost the game. I can't do that. Again, Ryan Day's got to wear his one and seven record. Figure it out, bud. But like, it is bullshit that that is a, that you're allowed to put 12 men out there, make some time run off the clock while they run a play, and then you don't reset the clock for the offense. Like it puts the offense at a disadvantage that they shouldn't be when the defense inadvertently did something on purpose completely trash that that was even a thing it took away some of the suspense of that game because i wanted to at least see ohio state attempt a field goal to try to win it and who knows maybe we're talking about a win instead of a loss in this this week um so that was frustrating and yes in some ways it did kind of cost them the game but uh i'm not putting it on 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 that and i also will say this as we worry about ryan day on a daily basis i don't know that ryan day would have been ready for that situation and that's another reason why i think the jig is up on him because like Dan Lanning sort of going Bill Belichick here, like he practices every situation. I don't know that Ryan Day was was practicing like, hey, we got to put 12 men on the field to help run the clock. I bet you that was news to him. I bet you he was kind of stunned by that one to even realize that that was a thing because it seemed like his team wasn't even aware that the clock was going to was gonna wind down um, and then they weren't going to get the time back. So um, yeah, that's, that's where my trust level is at with Ryan Day. All right, we go to second down. This was actually hilarious. USC – is currently doing something where they offer fans an opportunity to run out of the tunnel with the team before the game for the small fee of $1,800. And this past weekend, 
This is an absolutely hilarious troll job. A Penn State fan paid the $1,800 to run out of the tunnel with USC. And what's funny about this is he did it because they were like, well, I guess we got to let him do it. He paid the $1,800. Um, and it was such it was, it was a genius troll move by this Penn State fan. I absolutely love that he did this. Um, and then it forced USC to amend, and you can go to the website where you can where you can pay to do this for this experience. It forced USC to change the rule where they now say you need to be wearing USC gear in order to be able to participate in the running out of the tunnel um with the with the team at, at home games i wonder if somebody will now find the loophole in that which is they'll show up in usc gear and underneath have like an, an opponent's shirt on or like a hat in the hoodie pocket or something and they'll pull it out and put it on or take the hoodie off once they get out on the field um maybe just something that they should do away with because people are going to continue to try to exploit this now that this penn state fan did but i thought it was hilarious that penn state trolled them and then went on to win the game on on top of that so Pretty comical, if you ask me. But uh, yeah, I, I like that move. That 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 was a savvy, savvy move by that Penn State fan. All right, we go to third down, and in third down, we ask the question: If you have the number one pick in next year's draft, and yes, this is kind of you see this this helmet behind me over my left shoulder, this Browns helmet. This is because I think the Browns are starting to embrace the fact that they might need to draft a quarterback next year. Who are you taking if you have the number one pick in the draft next year? Um, I think this is a great question because Shadur Sanders is going to be the consensus, I think, quarterback that everyone's gawking at the this year and, and in the offseason and during draft season. But I honestly think, guys, that uh, there's some there's some stuff from Shadur that I'm just not sure is going to translate in terms of like there's some inconsistencies there. And I, I'm not trying to disparage him. I think he's a great player. But I, I, I wonder about like it translating to the NFL, his game. We'll see. But the other part of this too is like, I don't know if I would take Shitter Sanders because I don't know what kind of problems his uh, coach prime is going to cause. If you do, he's already talking about how he's trying to steer his kids to certain teams where he knows they can be successful. You think the Browns are going to be one of the teams on that list of, of, of the places that, that he's going to let his kids play in a, in a very like LeVar ball esque type situation. Like I doubt it. So I think there's risk in that in knowing like if you take him, Dion might just force your hand to trade him anyway or whatever. And so I don't know if you want to sign up for that, but I guess if I'm, if Shitter's probably going to be the answer, but I actually think Quinn Ewers has done so much the last couple of years where I feel pretty good about the idea that, that I, I think Quinn Ewers is going to translate to the next level. I really do. So I would probably lean Quinn Ewers at this point, but I understand where a lot of people are going to say Shador. Um, All right. Final one, fourth down. And we have an opportunity guys to see, Army Navy go at it in back-to-back weeks the way things are setting up because both are in the American Conference. Both are undefeated right now and leading the conference. So there's a chance that they would play in a conference championship game for the American Conference one week before and then go and play the following week in the Army Navy game um, and do like do basically have a have a double header against each other um, with with different stakes in each but um, still sort of the same stakes in a lot of ways. So I, I threw out the idea of like, maybe they would just make the army Navy game, the conference championship game and do away with the one the week before. But somebody mentioned to me, like when has college football or when has anybody ever turned down free money? Um, so doing it back to back weeks is going to give you a chance to, 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 to play the game um, and, and earn some money off of it. I'm also pretty sure that they play that at like the, the, whoever wins the conference is like home stadium. I don't think there's like a neutral site that they do it. I could be wrong about that. And so that would mean like the game gets played on, on one of these campuses, which I think would actually be really cool because you never get that between these two teams. So I'm actually all for them playing back to back and just letting it be like sort of a, a dog fight in that way where it's like, Hey, one's for the conference championship. One is for the commissioner's trophy. I think that's what it's called or the commandant's trophy. I forget. I should know this. My brother went to Navy. Um, I'm going to look this up. Trophy. This is great. Uh, this is great podcasting that you're hearing right now. It's the trophy between 
The Commander in Chiefs trophy. I knew it was something like that, man. I, I'm sorry. I fucked it up. That's my bad. But no, I, I, I love Army Navy, and I will continue to maintain that it's one of the best sports spectacles you can go to. I would recommend it to anybody. Anybody who's never been, go to the Army Navy game if you ever have the chance. It's awesome. The pageantry, all of it. Um, and so because of that, sign me up for back-to-back Army Navy matchups. Maybe one at one of the team's campuses, and then one, which I think it's in, and I think it's Landover this year, where the commanders play for the commanders and chiefs for the commander and chiefs trophy. How about that? Um, I'm I'm all for it. It would be I think a cool thing. What about you guys? How you feel about those four down territory topics? Are you uh, is Dan Lane is Dan Laney now on your your coaches you hate list because he pulled this move? Um, would you pay to run out of the tunnel with USC and then rip off your gear and wear and, and reveal Ohio State stuff if they were on the schedule this year? If you had the number one pick in the draft next year, which quarterback out of college are you taking? And are you are you on board with Army Navy back to back weeks coming up later in the season? All right, guys, that's gonna do it for me. Another episode of Sons of the Shoot in the books. We'll be back next week as we preview the matchup with Nebraska. It's going to be a big one. That Nebraska team is not one you should take lightly and continue going around the world of college football with Nick Wilson and myself. Appreciate you guys jumping on in. As always, we implore you to like, subscribe, review. Do not forget to review the podcast wherever you get your podcast: Spotify, Apple, Odyssey app. Did I mention Apple? And, of course, the 92 Through the Thin YouTube channel. We'll be back next week, as I said. But until then, enjoy a bye week. Less stress on your life that you don't have to watch Ohio State play. And, as always, go Bucks.